Hello, I'm Susan Elliott, the News and Special Reports Editor of Musical America. Today, we are speaking with David Stoll. David is the president of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, which in a highly unusual arrangement in our field anyway, has purchased Opus 3 Artist Management. The deal went through about a year ago. David is going to tell us how it works and what the thinking was behind the very concept of a conservatory owning an artist management company. Hi, David. Susan, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Just great, thank you. Yeah. So, um, of course, as you know, I wanna know all about this acquisition of Opus 3 and how it came to be in the first place. It went through, what, about a year ago now? Indeed, we, uh, we've had the company now for well more than a year. Uh, the, the initial conversation between David Foster and myself began in March of the pandemic. You know, I believe that was 2020, uh, of March 2020 is when we first started discussing right. it. What prompted the merger in the, or acquisition, I should say, in the first place? Well, I think for a number of years now, uh, we've imagined actually uh, developing either a partnership or acquiring a management company. So this was not an idea that was born just of the pandemic. It's just the opportunity presented itself uniquely because of the pandemic. Uh, the concept for why that would be a good idea is that if you look at any corporate model, you realize that often alliances between two companies can really result in if not only just efficiency, if you will, but also the opportunity to expand mission. And uh, that was the rationale for uh, approaching Opus 3. Uh, you know, at, from the top down, the reality is, is that we recognize that there was a gap in the world of serious artist management between, you know, young artists winning major competitions, say, and then their ability to go out and be on the road 200 days a year playing 200 concerts a year or 100 concerts a year that uh, the opportunity to steward somebody from one phase if you will of success to a full solo career was a was a gap it was opus 3 for sale is that how you came to know about it or how did that come out no opus 3 wasn't technically for sale but susan when as you know in the pandemic when concert halls shut down, presenters shut down. Um, it doesn't take very much thought to realize what's going to happen to a management company if there's no revenue coming right. back. Right. And um, what I was aware of is that the likelihood is that they would likely collapse or at least disaggregate into you know, managers with artists. Uh, you saw right. this happen with Cami, for example. We've seen it happen with a lot of firms. Opus 3 is really the last remaining large firm um, in North America. I don't know if it will remain that way, but the fact is, is it was certainly at a point where um, financially it had, uh, <laughs> it had done all that it could uh, right. under the circumstances. And um, so, you know, that, that presented the opportunity for David Foster uh, to start a conversation with me. And I actually instigated that conversation with him at first. Was this before or after David announced he was retiring? David had already announced that he intended to step down by March of 22. That was at okay. least known inside the okay. company. And he disclosed that to me right away. He said, David, right. I, this sounds like a great project, but I need you to know something. <laughs> he, was, he was forthright from the beginning. He said, I want to see this company go forward. I want to see my colleagues who are amazing have these great careers. And I think this would be brilliant to bring together um, a mission motivated model like this. I think we'd make great partners. Let's work on this, but you need to know that I intend to step back um, no later than March of, of 22. And who is running the show now? Well, David is still uh, running the show and we're in process of um, completing a search. Um, we expect to have an announcement certainly before March of 22. Um, we're not uh, in a rush to do so because the company is actually doing extremely well. 
Uh, David will continue as a manager at the company, of course. Um, and how but, big uh, is their roster? There are about 250 artists and attractions. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I wonder if you, it, it seems to me that the, the, the most direct um, kind of nitty gritty piece of this uh, is the Artist Apprentice Program. That's one piece of it. I, I don't know if I would say it's, <clears throat> it really is, we do see all these pieces is right. really critical. So how, how does that work? Does that mean that um, a, a San Francisco conservatory vocalist singer who has just graduated will automatically have an entree to Opus 3's roster? How does no. that work? Being an SFCM master student doesn't privilege your entry into the program. However, like any branded program, it's one that we want to operate in front of Opus 3. So it does mean that Opus 3 will have a unique program globally that contains four to six of the top young concert artists in the world. They'll be housed here at the Bose Center. They'll be flying out to be co-presented with partner artists at no cost to the presenter. Uh, the artist becomes a mentor. The artists do this voluntarily. No one's required to do it. So for example, Garrick Olson is very excited about this. You know, he's on our faculty, he's an Opus 3 artist. He really would love to have an apprentice uh, in the program. And so it just allows us to look across the world for who we think the next great soloist will be, find a place where they can really develop their talent over two to three years to see if they're ready to move into management. It's not a, it's not a bona fide degree, it's a professional studies program as we call them. And, Higher. And, and who pays for it? We pay for everything. So it's fully funded. Uh, the students receive a stipend. They receive money for travel. So we endow that position. So a, a donor gets to know that they're supporting an apprentice, which donors love to do. And that gives the apprentice a place to live, something to eat, you know, revenue and a travel fund. And then we fly them out to be co-presented with Opus 3 artists. When they're here in town, they coach and play and rehearse and work. Right. The repertoire that they're developing. They're totally right. focused on their career. You know, if Esapek is in town, he, you know, they can play for him. His conductors are coming through. It gives them contact points. And then they are being co-presented with Opus 3 artists at their locations, but at no cost to the presenter because we pay for the travel, you know, we pay for the person to be performing out there. But when you say we pay for the travel, the you go out and fundraise for a particular artist. For a, right? you know, a particular slot, right? So I need to, you have to understand, I don't know how much, so in higher education, if you want to, in, if you want to endow a full scholarship, let's say, here with no room board tuition to be about a million dollars. If you want to endow something that has room board tuition and fees plus a stipend, it's about $2.5 million. So right. Six $2.5 million gifts, which are the endowment funds that power these positions. It's just that the apprentices are managed by Opus 3 in conjunction with their partner artist. Got it. And the Got artists it. in Opus 3 volunteer. They're not required to do it. So right. it's about finding a match uh, between an artist who's excited about doing something like this or two, a manager who sees a talent they'd like to put into the program. And then we, you know, we raise the money. So we're well on the position uh, to being able to announce a number of those next year. But uh, that's, that's the artist apprentice model. That's how it works. It's a way for us to bring together a need that management has, a place where they can work with young artists, not push them too hard, but give them the support they need, right? And a place where we in higher education have access, be able to raise money around these ideas and donors who are excited about supporting this. And it creates a wonderful bridge between the two missions, right? It's us Got extending it. our mission and then bringing their mission to where they really need it to be to successfully look after young artists. But it also, I will tell you from a business point of view is a fantastic branding opportunity because it does mean that we are operating a program that is unique in the world and that uh, at a very high level produces these extraordinary artists. And again, that's in line with our mission as it is in line with the mission of Opus 3. Is it not unusual for a nonprofit to buy a commercial enterprise? Well, no, not really. I mean, it depends on, if, is it unusual in our world, classical music for that to happen? Yeah, yes. yeah. Is it unusual for a hospital 
to own a commercial enterprise as a nonprofit? No. You know, no. that happens all the time. Is it unusual right. for an R1 research institution to own a pro for-profit company of some kind based around technology they've patented in one of their research areas? No, it's not. So actually, it's not as uh, distant as you might imagine. It's fairly commonplace. It's just we tend to be so rigid in the world of classical music in our little containers. We don't tend to think this way. Right. So for our world, yes, it's a gigantic rock in the pond. And for the world at large, not nearly as uncommon as you might imagine. Interesting. But we're not interfering with, in any way, them being the great managers they are. They are doing their work, all right? We are not interested in money coming back out of Opus 3 to us, per se. That's not how this is designed to work. What we're interested in are all the mission-related connective points. So the artist apprentices, the opportunity to record and commission music, the opportunity to expand outreach, right? These three things, we haven't really talked about the out, and the final thing, and the most important thing perhaps, invent the concert experience of tomorrow together. Okay, those are the four things that matter. The logistics of how the, the corporate structures work are actually fairly straight ahead, Susan. It's not that, it's, you know, there's an LLC that's a holding company that holds Opus 3. Uh, we have a board, I'm the chairman of that board. You know, the president reports to that board of Opus 3. It's, it operates just like that, right? And, um, and so, you know, ultimately, without getting the details that I can't, I mean, I just, the way you might imagine this having worked is that the company was loaned money for a while, which it then pays back. When it's paid back, it's loan. It's paid back, it's loan. That's how we were able to sustain salaries and benefits and make sure that people could keep mm -hmm. working and supporting their artists. Mm -hmm. They're already out of the woods on all of these things. They're doing extremely well. But they also, the benefit Opus 3 is we're able to help reduce their back of house option. I mean, one of the things that people say is, is well, how does a nonprofit buy a for-profit? I think the expression used isn't that the tail, you know, wagging the dog. Yes. And I, yes. by the way, I describe that to people. I'm like, well, you know, we have hundreds of millions in assets and 435 employees. They have 37. <laughs> you know, this is a behemoth of an organization yeah. compared to a man any management company, except for those, if you will, in theater or film or sports. But in the classical world, um, any conservatory with substantial resources or university is going to from a corporate analysis point of view, outpace you know, a company that size. And that's true across the world. Look at the Mellon Foundation or the MacArthur Foundation or the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. I mean, you're talking about billions in resources, but yes, it's in a nonprofit shell because it's there to serve the public good. So, you know, what you're talking about are organizations that are not owned by anyone like the conservatory that are there to serve the public good but nonetheless are corporate entities that can accept donations to advance education scholarships and place young musicians in the world opus 3 operates as a for-profit company because they're a transactional business and they're very open about that you know right. they're actually the last remaining almost not completely but one of the few remaining transactional businesses or llc's in what is otherwise a nonprofit market. You know, all of their clients are almost exclusively nonprofits, presenters, universities, concert halls, orchestras. We're all in the 501c3 category. The management company acquisition was part of a broader strategic plan of this institution for quite some right. time. It's just the pandemic was the catalyst that caused it to happen. So it wasn't yeah. as if the pandemic occurs, we're you know, thinking, oh, hey, let's go out and buy a management company. What, what <laughs> happened is, is the pandemic occurred. We realized that if we were going to buy a management company, that likely we were going to lose any opportunity to have one that had any mass to it, that you're going to be down to essentially boutique companies. And the reason we wanted a company that was larger is because we want the apprentices, you know, you want 250 artists to choose from, if you will, because not all are going to want to work with apprentices. And that's right. legitimate. Right. But if you have 250 people out there, you know, probably some of them will want to, right? And not only that, you're right. presenting enough around the world that you can get that artist the exposure they need. You're so really thank you so, those, so those much for joining us. My, my pleasure, Susan, always. And thank you for, thank you for taking the time to meet with me. I appreciate it.